Now we'll talk about microbial growth control. And this is just controlling the microbial load or the number of microbes in an environment. And we do this all the time, right? Whenever we're cleaning the kitchen or we're washing our hands. And we have a lot of people in the history of microbiology to thank for this because as soon as we understood that microbes existed and we and germ theory kind of started, we understood what was making people sick, microbial growth control methods started to be researched and more well understood. So people like Louis Pasteur and understanding that microbes cause disease, Robert Koch, Joseph Lister for aseptic and surgery techniques, uh, Semmelweis for hand washing, a lot of this started happening and becoming standard practice once we understood that microbes existed. So the first thing you kind of have to ask yourself is how clean is clean. We have different standards for things being cleaned when we're talking about different types of um, environments, different types of items. Like how clean are the plates that you ate off this morning for breakfast compared to how clean is your carpet? Even if you just vacuumed it, how clean is your carpet? What about when you have surgery done? How clean is the surgical room? How is clean? How clean is the surgical equipment? And how do we determine when something is clean enough? And that's kind of what we're going to dive into that later on in the lecture. But really, whenever you're thinking about clean, it can have a lot of different definitions based on what you're talking about. This uh, bottom part of this slide right here is actually from your textbook. And it's a study that was done analyzing 11 locations in 18 different cars. And they took an environmental sample from each one of these locations, basically, and counted up the number of CFUs or colony forming units. So the number of bacterial cells or microbes present from that location. And you'll see that um, there were 256 CFUs or colony forming units on the handle. There were almost 400 on the steering wheel. These are places that we touch a lot. And we know that microbes can be transferred from place to place from lots of different things, but of course from touching them with our hands is one place, and then those microbes are transferred to our hands. And then of course we have to remember to wash our hands to reduce that microbial load before we touch our face or we eat something with our hands. And I don't know about you guys, but my car does not look like this beautiful picture here, so I cannot even imagine the number of CFUs in my car. And when we're talking about reducing the microbial load in our environment, we're really talking about fomites. Fomites are any inanimate object, anything. So it could be the doorknob to your room. It can be toys that your kids play with. It can be the towels in your bathroom. Any inanimate object that can harbor microbes and aid in the transmission of a disease. So how are microbes getting from one place to another and eventually causing disease? They're usually jumping from fomite to fomite to do so. And this is why hand washing is so important because we're constantly touching fomites. Everything's a fomite. Everything around you right now is a fomite. We're constantly touching things that can potentially harbor and hold on to microbes. And then we can touch them and we can touch our face and eat food and all that. This photo to the right here is what we'll be doing in lab. Um, I'm not sure when you'll watch this lecture, but we're going to do this in lab at some point. And this is called glow germ. And glow germ is kind of a stand in for bacteria. You put it on kind of like lotion and it's, uh, it acts a similar way to being washed off with, uh, with soap or surfactants. So you can see how good you are at washing your hands by looking at your hands under UV light and this glow germ glows. And we'll do this in lab again and you can really work on your hand washing technique. So kind of back to how clean is clean, we have different standards based on different environments. So in a lab environment, for example, there are different standards of safety and cleanliness based on what type of organisms you're working with. For our lab, uh, our microbiology lab at Santa Fe, we work with microorganisms that only go up to this biological safety level two. So there's one through four. Biological safety level four being the most extreme, most virulent, most high risk infection pathogens, things like Ebola. But we don't work with these, but you can see how in labs that work with more um, dangerous pathogens have to have higher standards for cleanliness. Also, when we're talking about how clean is clean or how clean do we want to make something, we need to consider what kind of microbes are we trying to target? 
and what kind of microbes are we trying to get rid of. The most susceptible microbes, or the ones that are going to be easiest to get rid of or kill or remove from the environment, are going to be enveloped viruses, gram-positive bacteria. Then we go down to the most resistant, the most difficult microbes to get rid of. Those are going to be endospores. And recall, we did talk about endospores. We talked about how not, not all bacteria, but bacteria like Bacillus anthracis can form endospores by replicating their genome, forming these hard protein coats around their genome, then drying themselves out. And they are extremely resistant in the environment and to a lot of microbial growth control methods that we'll talk about. Over the next couple slides, we'll talk about five different modes of control. So five different ways of controlling the amount of microbes in the environment. And first off, we have sterilization. And this is destroying all forms of microbial life, including endospores. Even though endospores are very resistant and resilient, for something to be considered sterilized, all microbial life is gone from that environment or that object. Of course, this is such an extreme level of microbial growth control that it's reserved for places like laboratories, um, medicine, and then uh, certain food industry applications as well. And we'll talk about an example of how you can sterilize something in a few slides. Then we have disinfection. And disinfection is for most microbes. So now we're not talking about all forms of microbial life. We're just talking about most microbes. And this is talking about surfaces of a fomite. And remember, a fomite is anything that can harbor a microbe. So disinfection reduces the microbial load on fomites. And this is not sterilization because we're not killing endospores anymore. Endospores tend to survive what uh, disinfection. And then examples of things we use for disinfection would be like bleach or vinegar, spraying down your countertops to clean up after making dinner. That is, that is disinfection. You aren't killing all microbial life, but you're reducing microbial load. Antiseptics is really similar to disinfection. But instead of talking about the surface of fomites, now we're talking about reducing the microbial load on living skin or tissues. So that would be something like um, isopropyl alcohol or hand sanitizer. And again, this is not sterilization. You are not removing all microbial life forms, but you are removing most and reducing the microbial load on your skin. Next up, we have degerming. And degerming is one that can kind of also belong with uh, antiseptics. It can also kind of belong with sanitization. But I want you to just be familiar with the word because you might hear it. But degerming is really just talking about reducing microbial load on commonly skin again, a lot like antiseptics. And it's commonly done by using something like soap, mechanical action of rubbing your hands together, making them soapy, and reducing pathogenic microbes um, on your skin. So hand washing is an important uh, mode of de-germing. Also, alcohol prep pads whenever you get a shot at the doctor is another example. And again, this is not sterilization because we're removing most, but not all, microbes from the surface. And then we have sanitization. And as I mentioned, something like hand washing, we kind of refer to as sanitization. But sanitization, we're also really talking about fomites. And we're talking about removing enough microbes from those fomites for levels deemed safe for public health. And that sounds kind of vague, but really the important takeaway there is that it's not removing all microbes. Because sanitization, pay attention that this, is, this does not say sterilization. They sound a lot alike sanitization and sterilization, but sanitization is not removing all forms of microbial life. It's not removing endospores. So a common example for something like sanitization would be dishwashers. Dishwashers remove enough microbes to be deemed safe for public health, like especially in commercial, for commercial dishwashers, maybe you go out to eat and they have reusable plates and utensils. Someone else used those plates and utensils. They were run through a dishwasher and then they were deemed safe for someone else to use. I'm not going to go over this whole chart again, but this is everything we just went over on those last few slides for the modes of microbial growth control. And it's just all on this one slide to keep everything together for studying. So now we're going to get into talking about different methods for microbial growth control, how we measure microbial growth control, 
and we really break down these categories into physical and chemical methods. So we're going to start off by talking about different physical methods of controlling microbes in our environment. And we're going to talk about the differences between their abilities for killing microbes or just inhibiting their growth because we don't always need to just kill all of the microorganisms in the environment. Sometimes we just need to stop them from growing, stop them from replicating themselves. And this is called static. So you're making the population static when you just stop the growth without actually killing the cell. And then the there's lots of things that come into play whenever you're trying to figure out what type of microbial growth control you should be using. The type of microorganism that's present that you're trying to get rid of. How much of the chemical do you want to apply? There are a lot, there are a lot of things involved with the toxicity to humans or the potential kind of negative impact for what you're doing with this control method and how it's going to affect the growth of the bacteria but how it's also going to affect human health or whatever you're trying to clean. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's food, maybe it's a surface, maybe it's a drug. But all that kind of has to be considered when deciding what microbial growth control method should be used. Now on the previous slide, I talked about how microbial growth control methods can kill microorganisms or they can, it can just inhibit their growth and that is cytal or static. So the prefix of a word will indicate the type of organism that is affected by that microbial growth control mechanism. So for example, fungistatic is effective against fungi. Bactericidal is effective against bacteria. The suffix of the word will indicate if that agent kills the microorganism or just inhibits its growth. A viricidal is effective against viruses and cytal is kill, so it kills viruses. A fungicide is effective against fun, uh, fungi, and it kills fungi. A bacteria static is effective against bacteria, and it is static, so it does not kill bacteria, it just inhibits or slows their growth. Now these are the physical methods of microbial growth control we're going to talk about over the next several slides. We'll talk about heat, cooling, desiccation, radiation, and filtration. So first off we have heat, and heat is one of the most common and oldest forms of microbial growth control. Think of boiling water or direct flames. And this mechanism is going to kill microbes. So if we're talking about bacteria, this would be a bactericidal. It's killing microbes by altering the membranes and denaturing proteins. Because remember, proteins and enzymes are really sensitive to different temperatures. So high, heats, high heat denatures proteins by breaking those hydrogen bonds that form the 3D structures of proteins and makes those proteins stop working and ineffective thereby killing the organism. And different organisms though respond different to high heat. For example, uh, Clostridium botulinum, or the causative agent for botulism, its endospores can withstand over 20 hours of boiling. And of course, this is talking about endospores. This is the most resilient biological structure. So it's extremely resistant to things like high heat. And what kind of uh, heat do you use to limit microbial growth in your daily life? Well, you use heat lots, lots of times. So whenever you're cooking, if you're boiling something, if you're putting something in the microwave, if you're washing your dishes in the dishwasher, if you've ever unloaded your dishwasher right when it's finished, those are some very hot dishes and they, uh, they're they difficult to put away. And that high heat is uh, helping to kill microbes during the washing cycle. So we use heat in our everyday lives in order to limit the microbial load on us and objects around us. The most effective type of heat is actually moist heat. So think of like boiling water. Moist heat really is able to penetrate membranes and penetrate microorganisms in order to denature those proteins and break down the membranes. And an example of some lab equipment that uses moist heat in order to uh, reduce microbial load is an autoclave. And an autoclave is one of those very few instruments that actually sterilizes items. And remember, sterilization kills 
all microbial life, including endospores. Autoclaves are able to do this by having all of this high heat steam in a sealed chamber. And that means at, at, in this sealed chamber, the steam is actually able to reach temperatures higher than boiling, higher than the boiling point. And so this extremely, extremely high heat above 100 degrees, it can go all the way up to 121 degrees Celsius, kills all forms of microbial life that are on the instruments um, put inside the autoclave chamber. Another example of how heat is used to reduce microbial load uh, is pasteurization. Um, we've probably all heard of pasteurization before. And this is an example of heat used in this cycling method. So for pasteurization, some type of product, this example is showing milk, uh, some type of product is heated to a high temperature for a short amount of time and kind of cycled in that high temperature. And then it reaches this cooling period where it's cooled down. So typical milk pasteurization involves milk being heated to 72 degrees Celsius only for about 16 seconds and then rapidly cooling to 4 degrees Celsius. So this high heat for a short amount of time is going to kill microbes that are in that product and then the rapid cooling is going to hopefully limit the milk proteins from being uh, destroyed during pasteurization. We just want to kill the pathogenic microbes. We don't want to destroy the uh, nutrient properties of milk or the taste of the milk in the process. There are other methods for pasteurization though. Um, on the last slide, we talked about this high temperature for a short time pasteurization. And this is what you'd see just at the grocery store in the refrigerated section, picking up your gallon of milk. But there's also, also ultra high temperature pasteurization. And this is heating milk for uh, two or more seconds up to 138 degrees Celsius. And this makes milk shelf stable. So this you would not see typically in the refrigerated section. This would just be stable on the shelf. And this is of course fantastic to make milk uh, more accessible to people that do not have access to the refrigerated section of a grocery store. Now think about this question for a second. Does pasteurization sterilize food products? And think of this word sterilize. We know that sterilize means removing all microbial life, all forms of life. So no, pasteurization does not sterilize a food product. Think of that milk we just talked about. Milk, you're most often going to get it from the refrigerated section of your grocery store, and it's kept refrigerated in order to reduce the microbial load in the milk over time because whatever microbes were left over after that pasteurization product uh, process can still multiply if given the opportunity so they're kept nice and cool so they don't multiply and make more of themselves in your milk that's the same concept behind refrigerating our eggs as well so pasteurization is not a sterilization product but it is really important for the food industry for reducing microbial loads for foods that are just accessible to the public. Now we talked about moist heat as a very effective way for limiting microbial growth, but then dry heat is also an effective way for limiting the number of microbes on an object or in an environment. First off, we have direct flaming. So directly putting an object into a flame is an example of dry heat. And this image is actually showing an individual using an inoculating needle, which we'll learn about in a lab if we haven't already by the time that you watch this video. And they're using a metal loop that they're sticking directly into the flame to kill all the bacteria that they had on their inoculating loop. The loops that we'll use in lab are plastic, so you won't be putting them directly in a flame. But this is one way that uh, inoculation, inoculating is done in microbiology labs. Another example of dry heat is hospital incinerators. And incinerators can reach temperatures up to 800 degrees Celsius or higher. So whatever is placed in here just gets burnt to ash and disposed of. So this uh, in hospital incinerators are commonly used to get rid of materials like dressings from wounds or surgeries, getting rid of needles and different types of pathology samples, and just turning them to ash and just completely destroying them. And then down here we also have a dry oven. This is just an oven that circulates very hot air. It's most often going to be used for 
uh, sterilizing glass and metal objects. So with all of these, um, if you don't want to destroy the object in terms of an incinerator, you have to be using an object that can withstand a lot of direct heat. So ultimately, how do all of those methods that use heat to control the growth of microbes really work? What are they doing at the microbial level? Well, one, they are destroying the membrane. So high heat destroys membranes by literally just melting the membrane and destroying the cell. And also the high, the high heat denatures proteins. So those are the two main ways that heat is controlling microbial growth. Our next physical growth control method is going to be cooling. And cooling is talking about low temperatures. And most often, low temperatures aren't going to kill bacteria. They're just, it's just going to stop or slow the growth. And the same can be said about refrigeration and freezing. Both methods most often aren't going to kill microbes, just slow down their growth. And so this would be an example of bacteria static if we're talking about bacteria. It's static, so it's slowing the growth. It's not bactericidal, it's not killing the bacteria. It's just slowing down metabolism so bacteria stop replicating. And this is really common for food preservation, which makes sense because we said refrigeration and freezing. To preserve your food at home, you put it in your refrigerator and you put it in your freezer in order for it to last longer. Makes perfect sense. This is also what we do in the lab. So after our bacteria has gone into the incubator to grow where it's nice and warm and cozy, it then gets moved to the refrigerator to stop growing, to slow down, so it doesn't overrun our petri dish that we put it in and we're able to observe it effectively. And so that is a, that's something that we're using every day in order for preservation. But we did talk about different organisms preferring different ranges of temperatures for growth. And psychrophiles were that range of organism that preferred growth at lower temperatures. So they, do, they are able to grow and replicate and reproduce at these lower temperatures. They are not inhibited. Their population is not static at low temperatures. An organism, as an example, is Listeria monocytogenes. And Listeria um, causes listeriosis, and this is a foodborne infection that's especially dangerous for pregnant women because this microbe can cross the placenta. So how does cooling control the growth of microbes? it slows down microbial growth. So it slows down metabolism. And by slowing metabolism, that means microorganisms are not replicating as often or at all, and the microbial load cannot increase once they're in a cooler environment. Now we have desiccation as a method for microbial growth control. And desiccation involves the evaporation or removal of moisture from inside of a cell, which ultimately slows down metabolism so much that the cell dies and is not able to replicate. This is something that's commonly used in the food industry. So dried foods can be, the moisture can be removed to increase shelf life. Things like raisins and evaporated milk have had moisture removed. And this can also be done uh, by changing the osmotic pressure. So adding a lot of salt or sugar to something that pulls the moisture out from the cells and um, into the extracellular environment. And that's how you can induce desiccation. But not all organisms are very sensitive to desiccation or an environment without moisture. So think of spores or endospores. Endospores are already desiccated. They remove the moisture from themselves to be resilient in the environment. So they're not going to care about desiccation. They're going to be able to withstand a low moisture environment. The same can be said about certain types of bacteria like Staphylococcus and Streptococcus. They can survive for a long time in very low moisture environments. So it poses a problem in like hospital rooms or hospital settings where there are dried secretion, uh, secretions of like mucus or pus or urine where these different types of microbes can withstand uh, low moisture environments for a long period of time. 
So how does desiccation control the growth of microbes? It, ult it ultimately stops or slows metabolism down. And without metabolism, bacterial cells can't divide, replicate, make more of themselves, and that ultimately limits the growth or the number of microbes on a surface. Now radiation as a form of microbial growth control. And you see there's two types, there's ionizing and non-ionizing. Ionizing radiation includes x-rays and gamma rays, and this is going to be penetrative radiation. So it can actually penetrate through objects or through tissues. And this is useful for sterilizing uh, medical equipment or medical devices that are still in their packages. So things like heart valves or catheters that are still in the package can be sterilized before that package has even been opened up because it's penetrative. Now non-ionizing radiation is going to be like UV light and this is non-penetrative. So it removes or kills microbes on the surface of an object but these, uh, this radiation does not pass through an object. And this is something that's going to be common in UV lamps used in hospital rooms or operating rooms. I've also seen little UV holders for things like your toothbrush or your phone in order to uh, kill microbes on the surface that way. So it's becoming, it's, um, it's pretty common. But in either case, ionizing or non-ionizing radiation, both are going to limit microbial growth by damaging the DNA. In both cases, DNA is damaged, and that means that the microbe can no longer replicate itself because its DNA has been damaged. And for the case of UV radiation, that's going to result in these things called thymine dimers, where there are two thymines next to each other in a strand of DNA, and it causes this bond between thymine dimers. So whenever that bacteria cell tries to replicate itself, it has these bonds between thymines that don't let it effectively replicate its DNA, ultimately resulting in cell death. So how does radiation control the growth of microbes? It damages DNA. And I want to mention here that does radiation only damage microbial DNA or single cell DNA? Absolutely not. Radiation is still damaging to multicellular organ organisms like us too. So it is not just selectively harming microbes. That's why you need to put on sunscreen, you know, so like the UV radiation from the sun does not damage your cells. That's why you have a gown that you put on before you have an x-ray done. Radiation is still very harmful to multicellular organisms too, not just microbes. All right, next up we have filtration. And filtration, the big takeaway here is that it's going to remove, not destroy or kill the microbes. It's just going to reduce the microbial load by removing it from a sample or from the environment. And for filtration, we can be talking about filtering liquids like drugs or IV fluids, or we could be talking about filtering the air. I'm sure you've all heard of HEPA filters, so the high efficiency particulate air filters commonly used in hospitals and in flow hoods in labs. And the thing with filtration is that how much it's going to be filtering out of a sample or the environment is dependent on its pore size in the filter. Filters have different pore sizes, and depending on how small those pores are, it will capture different types of microbes or particulate in the air. Most commonly, pore sizes are going to be around 0.2 microns, and that's going to capture most bacteria. There are ultra-fine filters that can go down to like 0.01 microns, and those can capture some large viruses, but for the most part, filtration um, just doesn't go down to a small enough pore size to filter out all viruses, because viruses are tiny. And then, of course, um, anything above that 0.2 or 0.3 micron range is going to be removed as it's filtered through. This is really useful for samples that are heat sensitive, so things that can't be heated up to a higher temperature to kill microbes, they can be filtered. So how does filtration control the growth of microbes? It reduces the microbial load.
So reducing the microbial load in a sample without heating it, without applying some type of radiation. So it's not killing microbial cells. It's just reducing the load in the sample or in the environment. Here's just a useful graph putting together some of those physical methods we just went over in one convenient slide for you to study with. Now we'll talk about chemical methods for controlling microbial growth. So we'll talk about halogens, phenolics, alcohol, surfactants, heavy metals, and aldehydes. And with all of these antimicrobial chemical agents, it really depends on how much you're using and how you're applying it in order to determine if it's going to kill microbes or just inhibit their growth, so if they're going to be cytal or static. And we'll talk about that, and we'll also talk about um, what kind of they're targeting in a microbial cell. For example, alcohol is going to target the microbial membrane, whereas other things in here are going to target proteins and inactivate proteins. So our first chemical method for microbial growth control is halogens. And halogens are oxidizing agents. And remember oil rig, O-I-L-R-I-G? Oxidation is the loss of electrons, reduction is the gain. So oxidizing agents rip electrons off things, and they're ripping electrons off of proteins and inactivating proteins, therefore stopping metabolism and killing the cell. So the types of halogens that we'll talk about, we have iodine. And iodine is a common wound disinfectant. It can also sanitize water. If you've seen the iodine uh, tablets that can be used in emergency situations. But it's really common for disinfecting wounds, but it can be sensitive to the skin. So we have iodophores next, and this is iodine mixed with some organic molecule. Most often it's less sensitive and irritating to the skin. It's a really common skin antiseptic before receiving some type of surgical procedure, and you may have heard of it as betadine or betadine. Next up is chlorine, and chlorine reacts with water to form hypochlorous acid, and it's this acid that's ripping off electrons and inactivating proteins. Chlorine's really commonly used for disinfecting water, like swimming pools or drinking water. You may use it daily as well in something called Clorox. So Clorox, is actually a derivative of chlorine as well that we use as kind of a daily general disinfectant. And then finally, we have hydrogen peroxide, which is technically not a halogen, but we talk about it here because it is a very, it's very similar to halogens in that it's an oxidizing agent. And then we talk about, we talked about this enzyme previously, this catalase enzyme. And catalase is an enzyme that organisms that use oxygen and create toxic, ox toxic oxygen species need to have. So they're gonna have this catalase enzyme because catalase converts hydrogen peroxide into oxygen and water, which is really important because hydrogen peroxide is an oxidizing agent and can inactivate proteins. But hydrogen peroxide has also commonly been used to disinfect wounds and um, to help with sores in the mouth it's not as commonly as used as it used to be, though, because it, it can also be toxic to our tissues as well because it is an oxidizing agent and this high O2 environment from converting hydrogen peroxide into oxygen and water can damage our tissues too. So how do halogens and hydrogen peroxide control the growth of microbes? They both inactivate proteins by acting as oxidizing agents and ripping off electrons from those proteins. Our next chemical method for microbial growth control is phenols. And phenols work by disrupting cell membranes and denaturing proteins. Primarily, they're going to disrupt cell membranes and they are selectively permeable, so they're going to be allowed to kind of pass through the membrane and disrupt it. When they're inside the cell though, once, uh, once they are inside, they can denature proteins. Some examples are lysol, which I'm sure we've all heard of. And look at this at the beginning of lysol. Lice. It disrupts cell membranes or lyses cells. So lysol, lyses cells. That's what it's doing. 
Then we have chlorhexidine. This is a common one that's used in like surgical scrubs. And then triclosan. And triclosan used to be way more uh, commonly used than it is now. Triclosan uh, is used in a lot of household products. So it shows some down here in terms of like soap and toothpaste, but it's also impregnated into certain um, types of materials and fabrics and cutting boards or kitchen utensils for people or for companies to say that certain products are antimicrobial. So they've kind of, they've been impregnate, impregnated with this triclosan. But overusing triclosan is leading to resistant strains. So microbes have been so exposed to this chemical antimicrobial that they have learned how to overcome it. And you may have heard this in, as super microbes or super bugs developing as a result of being resistant to these antimicrobial agents. Fortunately, in 2016, the FDA kind of started regulating triclosan. They banned the use of triclosan in just wash products like soaps and body washes because it was determined that adding triclosan to those types of products was really not worth it. It's just as beneficial and um, effective to wash your hands with ordinary soap for sanitization. Triclosan is still used in products though, like deodorants and cosmetics and stuff like that, but it's not as widely used as it was at one point. How do phenolics control the growth of microbes? They're going to lyse cells or disrupt cell membranes, and they're also going to denature proteins once they've entered inside of the cells. Now alcohol as a chemical microbial growth control method. Alcohols control microbes by dissolving the lipid content in their cell membrane. So cell membranes are made of that phospholipid bilayer. Alcohol is interacting with that lipid bilayer and disrupting it and killing the cell. Alcohol is not effective against endospores, no longer, no, no matter how concentrated the alcohol is or how long the exposure is, most often it's not going to kill endospores. But like with the halogens we talked about, a long enough exposure time can eventually kill endospores. Uh, phenolics, most of the time, they're not going to kill endospores, and alcohol as well is not going to kill endospores. We do use alcohol very commonly, though, in terms of a microbial growth control method. So think of hand sanitizer. We have ethanol and isopropanol. And think of the little alcohol wipes that your doctor uses before you get a shot. It's very commonly used in the health field. Or you may see little containers of or jars of alcohol sitting in your doctor's office where certain instruments will sit over time to let to kill microbes as they sit in that alcohol. How does alcohol control the growth of microbes? It destroys membranes. Next up we have surfactants as a chemical method for controlling microbes. And surfactants are going to be things like soaps and detergents. They're going to penetrate oily substances and then emulsify those particles or break down that oil so it's easily washed away. And so a perfect example of this is hand washing, like I said, soaps and detergents. So what you're doing when you're hand washing is you're breaking down that oil on the surface of your skin into smaller particles, and then the microbes that are attached to that oil can easily be washed away in that oily film on your skin that contains all those dead, scale, dead skin cells and microbes can just be washed away. And most often, this is not going to kill the microbes. It's just reducing the microbial load by uh, taking them off of the surface of your skin and washing them away. An example, though, of something that does potentially kill cells is a class of surfactants called quaternary ammonium salts, or quats. You may have heard of it as quats. And these are surfactants that can disrupt the membranes of gram-positive bacteria. They are not super effective against gram-negative bacteria because gram-negative bacteria have an outer membrane. They have two membranes. And that outer membrane can be disrupted, but then the cell has not been lysed or ultimately disrupted. So they're really only majorly effective against gram-positive bacteria. In fact, Pseudomonas species, like Pseudomonas aeruginosa, 
That is a type of gram-negative bacteria that loves to thrive in your soapy dishes at home. So if your soap dish looks anything like this in your bathroom, there's likely Pseudomonas aeruginosa hanging out here that's created a biofilm with other microbes in the environment. How do surfactants control growth of microbes? They're going to reduce the microbial load. Reduce the number of microbes that are on a surface. So think of hand washing and removing the oils on your hands and washing away microbes and dead skin cells. They can also kill cells in terms of the uh, quaternary ammonium salts or quats, but really I'm gonna focus on reducing the microbial load and kind of traditional hand washing and detergents and soaps. Now we have heavy metals. And heavy metals interrupt microbial growth or kill microbes by inactivating proteins. So they're going to disrupt that hydrogen bonding that forms that functional three-dimensional shape of a protein. So commonly there's silver, there's mercury, there's copper, and people have understood for a long time that these heavy metals do prevent microbial growth. Like in ancient Greek and Roman and Egyptian times, they had copper pots where they would store foods to kind of prevent the growth of microbes. They would also have shields or swords that had copper built into them, and then whenever they would get hurt in battle, they would take a shaving of that copper and put it into the wound. Really interesting that we have understood this for a long time, but I don't recommend doing that because heavy metals are toxic. They are very toxic to us and our tissues as well, so they are not selectively toxic. And we'll revisit selective toxicity in the next lecture. But selective toxicity is ideally some kind of drug or treatment would just target the thing you're trying to kill and it wouldn't damage the host or host tissues. But heavy metals are absolutely toxic to us as well. And they're not as commonly used as they once were because of that toxicity to humans. Because like silver nitrate eye drops used to be um, applied to, new to newborns to prevent eye infections, but now commonly there's antibiotics that are used to prevent those infections. And then there used to be a lot more heavy metal containing ointments that would be used for treating wound infections. They still are used to some degree, but now we are very aware of that toxicity to humans. Our last chemical method for microbial growth control is aldehydes. And aldehydes are alkylating agents, so they contribute an alkyl group and disrupt the structure of something. For example, disrupting the DNA structure. They can also disrupt the structure of enzymes and that specific hydrogen bonding that gives them their specificity. Because remember, enzymes are made of proteins, so they do have that specific 3D shape. And aldehydes can kill all types of microbes, including endospores, with a long enough exposure time. And the, commonly, it's going to be in the form of a disinfectant liquid. So it can kill types of bacteria in as little as 10 minutes. But if you leave something exposed for as long as like 10 hours, that long exposure time can eventually kill endospores. And a common example for that for sterilizing like surgical, surgical equipment is Cydex. You may have heard of it as Cydex. That's a type of glutaraldehyde. And this is something that surgical instruments may just be sitting in over a long period of time in order to uh, reduce microbial load and actually sterilize and remove all microbes from the surface. Aldehydes are also great because they are still very effective in the presence of organic matter, like blood or feces, and it's not going to damage plastic, so plastics can sit in these fluids for a long time. And you may have also heard of formaldehyde. So formaldehyde is a type of aldehyde that's commonly used for preserving tissues and for embalming because it's still effective in the presence of that organic matter. So think back to all of those physical and chemical methods for microbial growth control that we talked about throughout this whole lecture. And I just want you to think about the different types of action they had on the cell for killing it or disrupting its growth. We talked about interfering with the cell wall. We talked about interfering with protein synthesis. We talked about interfering with nucleic acids and metabolic pathways, which also is really important with protein synthesis. If you don't have proteins, you can't go through the metabolic pathway because you don't have those enzymes to help you make the metabolic ha pathways happen. We also talked about inhibiting membranes 
And then ATP synthesis is also important in terms of the metabolic pathways and protein synthesis. So there's lots of different things we can target when we're trying to kill a microbe. And we're gonna see in the next lecture, we're thinking about all of these things and we're also considering selective toxicity. How can we target a specific thing that's specific to the microbe so it's not going to damage our cells or our tissues? Again, this is something we're going to visit again on the next lecture, but just keep in mind each of these modes of action for these different antimicrobial agents, both physical and chemical, what they target, what's ultimately happening to the cell, how is it killing or inhibiting the cell. So targeting the cell wall disrupts the integrity of the cell. When the cell wall integrity is disrupted, that can lead the cell to bursting, damaging, releasing all of its contents out into the environment. It's kind of a similar thing with the cytoplasmic membrane. Whenever the membrane is damaged, then all that cellular content leaks out. It's no longer a complete cell and the cell dies. Protein synthesis. Proteins are really important for lots of things to happen. So all of metabolism to happen. So not just a transcription and translation and all that. Proteins play a really important role in everything from replicating our DNA to going through the metabolic processes. So when proteins are damaged, then the cell's not able to go through all of those actions and be a living cell anymore. And then denaturing proteins. This is often going to be done through a physical control method, so like high heat or changing the pH, but very similar to uh, damaging proteins ultimately is going to affect things like metabolism and DNA replication. And I mentioned this briefly with triclosan. So the drawback of overusing these antimicrobial agents, especially those chemical antimicrobial agents, can lead to resistant microbes or superbugs. And those are going to be microbes that are no longer influenced, their growth is not impacted by the presence of a certain antimicrobial agent. So that means they can still grow and proliferate in the presence of these antimicrobial compounds, which is very dangerous. And we'll talk about this again whenever we talk about and uh, bacterial growth control mechanisms in the body. So talking about things like antibiotics, whenever microbes become resistant to antibiotics, now that antibiotic can no longer be used as a possible treatment pathway for someone. So it's very, um, it's potentially very, very, very bad for humans. And then how would pathogens go about sharing those resistance genes? Again, this is showing conjugation, bacterial conjugation through a sex pillus. And that would be some microbe has learned how to overcome an antimicrobial agent. It has the information on a plasmid, so some separate piece of genetic material. And it's going to share and copy that plasmid with some other cell. And then that cell can then share with other cells or replicate itself and share with all of its offspring. So that is one way that bacteria are able to share these resistance genes with other types of bacteria and overcome these antimicrobial agents.